my name is Kelly Healy. I am a registered dietitian with Spectrum Health. And I live up here in the Grand Rapids area, but I actually work down at Zealand Community Hospital. So this actually worked out really well today. <laughs> um, so it looks like only women are interested in carbohydrates. <laughs> um, I've, been a, I've been teaching classes for the past 13 years as a dietitian, and I would say I have a lot more patients that are female, and a lot of times they go home and they share the information with their families and loved ones. So I'm not completely surprised about this here today. Uh, the topic is simple carbohydrate, or carb, as we usually call them, counting. And then I decided to kind of broaden that up a little bit. Um, carb counting is used a lot in diabetes and nutrition management and blood sugar management there. Uh, but I wanted this to be relevant to people that even if you don't have diabetes, you'll still, you know, carbs are still something that we deal with every single day. So hopefully we'll answer some questions that you have there. And you do have the PowerPoint presentation. It did not copy very well, so I apologize for that. I will send an updated version with a different background so that you can actually read what it says here. But we do have the slides here as well, so we'll do that. And then this actually worked out kind of well because I wanted to ask you guys some questions, but the answers are on the slide, so if you can't read it very well, I can still <laughs> ask that. <laughs> um, so this is the agenda for today. What are carbohydrates? What else do I need to know about carbohydrates? How many carbs do I need? And other helpful and healthful meal planning tips. So, this is what I was actually thinking. <laughs> There's three main things in food that give our body energy. Do you guys know what those are? And they're listed up here. You got it. Carbs, protein, and fat. <laughs> Open book exam here. <laughs> So I remember sitting in my Nutrition 101 class and when the professor said there's three things in food that give the body energy and they're these three things, I was like, whoa, there has, there has to be more than that, you know? But no, these are the simple building blocks of nutrition, the things that give the human body energy. There is a fourth that I didn't put up here. Does anybody know what that one is? What? Not water. But we need water in order to do all the chemical reactions that these things help with. Alcohol. <laughs> so alcohol is a different chemical compound. It does provide the body energy, but not a lot of nutrients. That's why I didn't really include it today. But that would be the fourth if, if you're ever on a trivia show and they ask you that question. <laughs> hmm? Is it just a key and some Oh, man, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so, our bodies really, you know, and again, you may go online and you may find different sources. I always try to present good, sound nutrition information as a registered dietitian. So, carbohydrates, they are the body's preferred source of energy. It's what the body recognizes as fuel. It can break it down into sugar or glucose, and that's what our cells want to use for energy. Um, also, our brain, people don't always realize that our brain operates on carbohydrates. So there's actually a minimum amount of carbohydrates that every single person needs, which is about 130 grams a day, which if somebody were doing a low or a no carb eating plan, I would be concerned that they weren't getting enough of that glucose for their brain. Um, the body can use some of the other nutrients to make the glucose that it needs, but it, it's really not the preferred way to go about doing that. Uh, also in one of my nutrition classes, I remember a different professor saying that the low and no carb styles of eating, it's kind of like running your body on a generator. And then the question was, how long does a generator last? Until <laughs> it runs out of fuel, yeah. <laughs> so it'll work for a little while, but it's not really a long-term way to run whatever you're trying to run. So same thing with the human body, if it's not preferred. We can use the carbohydrates immediately in the form of glucose, or we can store them in the form of glycogen. Does anybody know where we store glycogen? If you do, I'll be very... <laughs> in our muscle cells and our liver. 
So our body can pull it from our muscle cells and our liver, change it into glucose if needed. So the body's really smart, has some backup plans. Then protein, every single cell in our body needs protein in order to function and regulate the chemical reactions that occur. Also helps our immune system work properly, so especially now that it, we're, have been told that it's gonna drop a certain amount of degrees this week, and we do wanna make sure that our immune systems are strong. So getting enough protein can help with that as well. One of the myths out there, sometimes that I hear, is eating more protein equals building more lean muscle mass. Do you guys think, is that true or false? If I eat a lot of protein, I'll get muscles. It'll make you get muscles. There you go. <laughs> it might help keep the muscles. So we still have to do the work. We still yeah. have to do the physical activity in order to build those muscle cells, increase them in size. But the pro it's kind of like if you don't have enough protein, you won't be able to do that. So you need it in order to do that, but just eating it itself doesn't do that for us, again, unfortunately. And fats, every single cell membrane that we have in our body needs fat in order to operate. And fat can also be stored to use as energy when needed. So again, lots of backup plans there. In case anybody was wondering what glucose looked like, that's what it looks like as a molecule. So we have both carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is the part that starts to get probably more relevant is there's such things as simple carbs and complex carbohydrates. Again, we get all the science stuff out of the way at the beginning. With the simple carbohydrates, those have one or two glucose molecules. They're known as monosaccharides and disaccharides. Complex carbohydrates are anything that have 20 up to thousands of glucose molecules. We call those polysaccharides. So the human body is very good at breaking down all of those different types of saccharides, except for fiber, into glucose to use for energy. So that would actually be a good time to answer, it was Angela, mm -hmm. your question about fiber, does it cancel out carbohydrates? So with fiber, humans don't have the enzyme to break it down and digest it and absorb it. So there's no energy that we absorb from fiber. So technically it's a carbohydrate, but it doesn't provide the body with any energy or calories. What would be the benefits, however, of including fiber into our diets? Helps with digestion. Helps with digestion. It helps move everything through at the right speed. What else? Makes you feel fuller. Makes you feel fuller. Kind of acts like I like to think of it as a sponge. Mm -hmm. As long as you're drinking enough fluids, water, it'll help it expand, and that's what provides the feeling of satiety. Absolutely. Can you think of anything else? Helps with blood sugar regulation. Also helps with cholesterol too, because it kind of sweeps those things along with it. It helps prevent us from absorbing all of those things that we really don't want to absorb. Does that? Answer the fiber question. Okay. What foods contain fiber? Vegetables do. Fruit does. Whole grains, especially less processed grains. One more food group that I usually think of. Beans and lentils. So those are the four main places. And what do all of those foods have in common? Where do they all come from? Hmm. The, earth. the earth, yes. <laughs> so they're plant-based. So pretty much anything that is plant-based grows from the ground. As long as it's not overly processed, it's gonna be a great natural source of fiber. One way to make sure, does anybody here, I, I have yet to have anybody raise their hand, yes, I'm doing this. Does anybody here count their fiber grams a day? I'm still waiting. It's okay if you do, I, that'd be awesome. <laughs> But um, most Americans are getting about half the amount of fiber that it's recommended to get. We're not getting enough. So rather than counting, oh, am I getting 25 or 30 grams? What, one way you can do is, let's say you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I hope you eat those three meals a day. At each meal, try to eat two foods that are a good source of fiber. So did anybody do that this morning? The 
nice nutritious breakfast you had. <laughs> okay, since you know that, what could you do tomorrow morning for breakfast? Two foods that have fiber. I'll go through it. Whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, and lentils. There you go! Awesome! <laughs> oatmeal and fruit. Yep, oatmeal is a whole grain and fruit is a great source of fiber as well. You know, at lunch if you had, let's say, a sandwich and you had whole wheat bread or you had a wrap that had whole grains in there and then you include some vegetables in that sandwich or wrap, that could be another way to get your two foods out. Alright, let's go to the next slide. Thanks. <laughs> so we get carbohydrates from lots of different places. And this is where we're going to go into the, is there a difference between good carbs and bad carbs? I think that exact slide is either next or right after that. So we get carbohydrates in our starches and grains. Typically when I teach a diabetes class or a pre-diabetes class or anything where we're talking about carbohydrates, most people identify the grains and starches pretty quickly, like, yeah, I know that those have carbohydrates. We don't realize that vegetables, and those are usually broken down into two categories, the starchy vegetables and there's the non-starchy vegetables, which do have a little bit of carbohydrate, good source of fiber, vitamins, minerals, a lot less calories. So when you hear starchy vegetables, what ones come to mind? Sweet potatoes, potatoes, yep. Yep. A couple more. Carrots, we can actually count them in the non-starchy group. And, you know, it's, it's a continuum, but they kind of had to put a line there, <laughs> so we kind of round out. So carrots, yeah, they might have a little bit more calories and carbohydrate than some of the other vegetables, but we can absolutely count them as a non-starchy vegetable. Peas would be the other one, and then our winter squashes. So I don't think we said butternut, acorn, pumpkin. Those we're going to count them as a starchy vegetable. Fruit is another place. I know we talked about fruit already. That's another place where we can get carbohydrates. Uh, I will say a little thing there about fruit. Sometimes people think fruit has sugar. I should avoid it. Would you guys say yay or nay to fruit? Yay to fruit. Okay. I agree. Because there's a lot of nutrients in that fruit. There's a certain kind of fiber that helps that you're not going to find in a lot of other food. Helps with digestion. And then the other thing is that fiber, it also kind of encapsulates the sugar. So your body recognizes that fruit as a nutritious food versus some of the other simple sugars or foods that have the sugar added to them where there's not those other nutrients or that fiber. So absolutely, you know, um, including fruit as part of a balanced diet or meal plan, I would always encourage that. Uh, milk and dairy have carbohydrates. They also have protein, and depending on what type of food it is, it might have some fat. All forms of sugar. Sometimes I'll have, well, what if I get brown sugar, or natural sugar, or honey? Is that better for me? Well, not really. The body breaks it, recognizes it and breaks it up down all like sugar. So there's not really a, a nutritional benefit there, but I have noticed that some people with like honey, for example, it has more flavor so they can use less. And that, that would be kind of key, is if you can use less of any of the sweeteners, that would be a good recommendation. And then any food with added sugars. So into their sweets, desserts, candy, soda, pop, and other sweetened beverages. So it's not naturally occurring, it's added sugar, but that's also a carbohydrate. So next slide. So factor myth, there are good carbs and bad carbs. This kind of is a trick question. <laughs> and does shake well, it out? Is it more of a process, unprocessed type of thing as yes. opposed to good and bad? Yes. Anybody, I mean, that's perfect. Does anybody else want to add any thoughts to that? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, it's hard. It's hard to put things in a good category and a bad category. Uh, I like the last thing there. You really you want to look at the whole big picture. You don't really want to hone in on one specific food. 
Um, can I never have ice cream because I know it's higher in calories and fat and sugar? Uh, so it is true that some carbohydrates, this is kind of the way that I like to think about it, some of those foods are going to provide your body with more nutrients. You're going to get more bang for your buck. Our bodies will break down and digest simple carbohydrates, so the ones that have the sugars, it'll do that faster compared to complex carbohydrates. So what would be what would be the issue with breaking down and digesting some carbohydrates faster? Yeah, I would say that it's probably when you kind of crash. Yeah. All of a sudden you're really hungry again. You got it. So even if you know people that have diabetes, people that have prediabetes, people that don't have diabetes, the same thing happens in our bodies. If we eat a lot of those simple sugars, it raises the blood sugar faster and it brings it down faster. So if we're trying to control our appetite, our satiety levels, we want to try to minimize how many simple sugars. You got it. So yeah, I wouldn't say that there's good and bad. There's kind of room for all of them. Uh, one of the things that we'll get to is how to work in what. With kids, I call them the sometimes foods. You know, there is room for the sometimes foods, which would be the ones that have less nutrients. So what would be an example of the simple sugar? Oh, sure. Okay. You guys are on. <laughs> <laughs> so over here on the left-hand side, those are the carbohydrates that tend to have more nutrients. And then over here on the right-hand side, those would be the foods that have less nutrients and tend to fall more into the simple sugar. So if those are ones that our body can break down faster, we can have that raise or spike in blood sugar and then the drop faster. And again, there's not a lot of fiber in the refined grains or really processed grains and starches, the snack foods. Fruit juice <coughs> compared to a piece of fruit, even though it has the same amount of calories and carbohydrates per serving, the fruit juice does the same thing because it'll raise it, the blood sugar faster and bring it down faster. <laughs> Where over here we have whole grains. So again, if you think about that fiber, it kind of wraps around the sugar, the carbs in there, and it helps slow how fast it's broken down and digested. Minimally processed grain and starch foods. So if you were at the grocery store, you were in the bread aisle, how would you know if your bread was a whole grain or a refined grain? There's a couple ways to tell. What would you look for? She's got it. <laughs> you want to see it at the beginning because that's what majority of the ingredient they, they're listed in order of mass. So if you see whole grain as the first ingredient, that means that's what they use most of. And then you want to go down. If you read through the, about the first three or four ingredients, you'll get a good idea of what the food was made of. Yep. Uh, and you want to you want to look for that word whole. Sometimes it'll also be on the front of the package. So it may say whole wheat, whole grain, but you really want to turn it over to the ingredient list and make sure it's the first ingredient. I've gotten fooled myself with my 12 grain bread. I got it home, none of those grains were whole. <laughs> we use a lot of different refined ones. So does that mean what refined is? So they kind of scrape the fiber, scrape the nutrients off. A lot of times those are lighter in color. Um, so you kind of look a little more denser, heavier. Could be. It depends. Which one do you think are more dense or heavier? The whole grains? Whole. Or, yeah. And then I've also seen the light breads, have you been, or the reduced calorie breads. And the way that they bring down those is they actually use more water and more air. So that would be a lighter way, that, but they're still using whole grains. Can I ask? Yes. What do you think of the fully sprouted breads now? You know, I think if you like that, it's fine. Uh, they're, they're very nutritious, they're a little bit more expensive, and they spoil faster, mm -hmm. so I know a lot of people will keep them in the, in the fridge or in the freezer. Yeah. Um, very nutritious. So, you know, I think it's a personal preference if you, if you like the taste and the texture. If you do, go for it. Costco does? Okay. Fully spreaded, three loaves, take one with it, two in the freezer, one in the fridge. I it's personally like them. I like it's got them. Protein. It's got pro yeah. yeah. There's, you're gonna get, especially in those, you're gonna get a lot more fiber and a lot more protein. You're not gonna get those in the other foods. So this goes back to looking at that big picture that we talked about. Uh, some people will ask, and I did include it in the 
slides, but I did want to mention it. The things like the glycemic index. Have you heard of that? What do you, when you hear the glycemic index, what do you think of? Sugar level. Sugar level, okay. If it's lower on the glycemic index, then it's kind of going to maintain longer as opposed to spiking. And yeah. So what it does is, it, that's what it is. It's a serving of food and it's measuring how fast, on average, because remember we all break down and absorb things a little bit differently, but on average, how fast does it raise a person's blood sugar? The thing that you have to take in mind, in the mind though, is it depends on how much of that food you eat. There was a book that came out a while ago, and it kind of made carrots, mm -hmm. the, the bad guy. Well, they were giving those people a pound of carrots. Most of us are not going to eat a pound of carrots. You know, if we did, uh, yeah, it's going to raise our blood sugar. But if you stick to a serving of carrots, they're much lower. Uh, what does your overall intake of foods and beverages look like? Again, you don't want to kind of narrow in. You want to look at... What, is, what am I eating over the course of a few days, over the course of a week? How am I doing there? Kind of take a step back. What else is being eaten with the carbohydrates? If you eat some protein, if you eat some fat, that's going to take longer for the body to break down and absorb. So same thing. If you ate you know, just rice by itself, yeah, it's going to raise your blood sugar. But if you ate a meal with some stir fry that had vegetables and chicken and um, probably a little bit of oil in there for fat, that's going to slow down how fast the body absorbs that rice. And then this was another trivia question. <laughs> if you're ever on a trivia show, you will now know that the human body has 37 trillion, 200 billion cells. That's a lot of cells. And every single cell in our body needs glucose for energy. So the more that we move, I put that up there because it's moving versus not moving. The more physically active, the less sedentary you are, the better the body can use the carbohydrates after we eat them. It also helps with insulin resistance. You may have heard that term. Um, that is something that could lead to type 2 diabetes. So that's why we know that physical activity can help prevent or delay developing type 2 diabetes for some people. This one. Carbs are fattening. Eating low carb is the best way to lose weight. Can you think of that? <laughs> I've got a lot of people. Oh, I'm still kind of scared of carbs. Still don't want to overdo it with them. So as far as carbs being fattening, you know. Let's go back to that. It's kind of like a teeter-totter. If, if we eat more of anything, more calories of any type of thing, be it carbs, protein, fat, our body will absorb those extra calories, store it as body fat because it thinks there might be a time where we, we're going to need it in the future in case we don't have access to food, which we know in our environment, in our society, that's very rare these days. Most of us have access to food anytime we want it. So, but again, that's how the body was set up. The research, there's been actually a lot of research studying different styles of eating. And it's mixed as far as the results with low or no carb. Some research has shown that it could help with weight loss. This one I've always thought was interesting. If you choose the right type of protein and fat foods, it could actually also help with heart health, which if we don't know, Heart health is still, or you know, heart attack and stroke are still the leading cause of mortality for both men and women in the United States. So I feel like it's it's becoming very common, but it's still something that we have a lot of work to do there. So healthy, when it talks about healthy sources of protein, what would those be? Lean meat. Leaner meat. Because we know that the fat that's found in the animal meats, or really any animal food, that's the one that's it's saturated, and that's what increases our cholesterol. So we definitely want to choose leaner meats. Uh, I would also say like some beans, some vegetarian protein sources, 
could be a good addition. And then healthy fat versus unhealthy fat. What would go in the healthy group? Yeah, comes back to those, a lot of those plant-based fats. If it comes from a plant, it's probably more heart healthy. There is one exception, and that would be fish and seafood. Those have omega-3s, which are really heart healthy, and they don't come from a plant. My next question to somebody is, is this something you could follow long-term or would want to follow long-term? I like the, the question, would you, is this a diet that you feel like you could do for the rest of your life? If not, we probably want to go back and find something more moderate. And how low is low? A lot of those really extreme, strict, no-carb meal plans have kind of gone away. I have seen a lot more that are becoming more mainstream that have moderate amounts of carbohydrate, which they do include the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grain, the dairy. If a food, if it excludes all carbs, you're going to be missing out on fiber. Because remember, you guys told me that fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, those are the only places where we can naturally get fiber. And those contain carbohydrates. So you'd be missing out on all of your fiber and certain vitamins and minerals if you cut them all off. So, you know, I think it's okay, but I wouldn't go, I would never recommend for anybody to go no carb, but we could go kind of like a low or moderate carb, especially if we're choosing those healthy carbs. How many carbs do I need? It depends. <laughs> so it depends on our body composition. If we have more lean body muscle, that is more metabolically active. And I've seen studies that have said it's anywhere up to 50 times more metabolically active than the fat tissue that we have. So that's really beneficial because even just sitting here, if we have more lean muscle mass, our metabolism is going to be higher. We need to eat more. Their body needs that extra energy. Our activity level, the more you move, the more energy you need. And then age, I usually get that one as, you know, age definitely has affected my metabolism. The thing there is, it seems like it, but it's really the, our, our lifestyle, our behaviors, our habits have changed, you know, because a lot of times I'll get people, well, you know, in high school when I played football or I ran track, Oh man, I could eat whatever I wanted, you know, but now that I'm older, my metabolism has slowed down. Well, it's because we're not doing those same activities, and yeah, we probably have lost some of that lean muscle mass. So continuing to stay physically active as we age can help also keep our metabolism elevated where we want it. And then how many carbs do I need? There's a few different ways that we could figure this out. The carb counting, so I know that was the topic of the class today, that's typically used with people that have diabetes, especially if they're using insulin, because they have to know, you know, they're using insulin because their pancreas isn't doing its job anymore. So they have to know, how much am I gonna eat so that I know exactly how much insulin do I give to myself. But we will, there's a slide that talks about that, so you'll have an idea. The plate model, I really like that. I use that with people of all ages, you know, even with my kids that I teach. I can show them the plate model, and they're really good at grasping that concept. It's pretty simple. And then following an eating plan. So that can be useful for people that prefer a more structured plan to follow. That's what we, we kind of used to call diets. <laughs> but now I like to call them eating plans or eating styles. So this would be the carb counting. So one carbohydrate serving, out of all those foods that we've mentioned so far that contain carbohydrates, it's the amount of that food that contains 15 grams of carbohydrate. So that looks different depending on what the food is. You know, so one example would be a teaspoon of sugar has, wait, let me go up. Yeah, a teaspoon. <laughs> a teaspoon of sugar counts as one carb compared to a whole slice of bread. You know, most of us would say, yeah, that bread, I'm going to get more satisfied off of the bread compared to just a little bit of sugar. So, and that's on the next page. But right here, this is a good, this is something, again, even if, you know, you don't have diabetes, I find this really useful, is women that are trying to lose weight need about two to three carbohydrate choices per meal. 
So that goes to talk about how many per meal. We're using the assumption that you are eating three meals a day. And that would look like, since we said that one serving is 15 grams, that would look like 30 to 45 grams at breakfast, 30 to 45 at lunch, 30 to 45 at dinner. Men typically need a little bit more. It is because they usually have more muscle and less body fat than women. That's really what makes the difference there. And then the next column is if you're trying to control your weight, you're not, or I'm sorry, maintain your weight, you're not trying to lose any weight, your needs may be a little bit higher. So for women, it would be the three to four servings per meal, and men, it would be about four to five servings per meal. And then if we go into the next slide, this is an example, and again, if you wanted a longer list, I can send that when I send the slides that are easier to read. But these are some of the commonly eaten foods. So what counts as a serving of carbohydrate? One slice of bread, a third of a cup of rice or pasta, a one half of a small potato or a quarter of a large potato, a half a cup of cooked oatmeal, half a cup of quarter peas, half a cup of beans or lentils, one six inch tortilla, 15 to 20 chips, one sixth of a thin crust frozen pizza. Counts as one carb serving. On to the next column is a small piece of, oh, sorry. <laughs> a small piece of fruit about the size of a tennis ball, a half of a large banana, about three quarters to one full cup of berries, one cup of melon, one cup of milk, two thirds cup of unsweetened yogurt, a half of a chocolate sandwich cookie with vanilla frosting, and half of a regular sized cupcake. So then if we go back to the slide before that, so you, you know, depending on how many carbohydrates you need, uh, yeah, I'll just use because we're all women in this room. So for most women sitting in this room, we would want between two to four servings at each meal. Go to the next one. So let's say you want to, I could sometimes think of it like money. You have three dollars. How do you want to spend those carbs or those dollars at breakfast? Well, I'd rather have a full cup of oatmeal that comes as two carbs. And yeah, you know, I'll put some blueberries on there. Or maybe I'll do a little bit of blueberry and a little bit of milk. I like milk on my oatmeal. So you decide how do I want to use those carbohydrates each time that I use them. You know, for the pizza, if we're trying to stick to that about three servings, we're not going to get a lot of pizza. And I usually tell people too, don't try to get satisfied off of just eating pizza. Try to add, you know, a glass of milk, a serving of fruit, maybe some salad. Add something else to help balance that pizza out because it's really, really easy to overeat some of those higher calorie foods if we don't think about how we're going to balance them. And then this is the plate model. This is one that I said is a pretty simple concept. Just about anybody can use it. Have you guys seen this before? It looks like most people have, some people haven't. Here in the U.S., they got rid of the food guide pyramid because I don't know about you guys, but it was not very user friendly. It was like the grains and the fats and what do, what do I actually eat? So this is the spectrum plate version and then the next slide is the um, myhealthyplate.gov, which the USDA came out with. The idea here is at our meals, and this is usually more like a lunch or a dinner meal, you want to try to do about half of the meal non-starchy vegetables. So on this example, they have salad and carrots. Then on the other half of the plate, that's where you want to split that in half, do about a quarter of that your starch, so your uh, carbohydrate, like here they have a baked potato, and then the other quarter, your protein food. So here they have a grilled chicken breast. So no matter what foods you're choosing, if you stick to those portions on your plate, you're probably not going way over the calories and you have a really balanced nutrition nutrition meal there. If you're somebody that just eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner and you don't have any snacks, you may want to also include your fruit and your calcium containing food to really balance out that meal. And then same thing, just a little bit laid out different. It doesn't have the actual food on there. That's the myplate.gov and you can see that it has the plate portioned off and Give some examples of what foods to put where. And then following an eating plan. So this is something that research keeps saying it really depends on what works best for you. You know, following that low, moderate carb works best for you and it's something you think you can stick to, they've seen really great results. 
if following a more low fat meal plan has worked for you or you think it'll work for you, that has good results. Uh, kind of more of an extreme version, but like a, a vegetarian or even a vegan or a plant-based style of eating, amazing health results. You know, really reduces the risk of diabetes, heart disease, but you would have to think, am I somebody that can follow that type of eating plan? Avoid ones that exclude entire food groups. Again, as a dietitian, I'd be really concerned if you wanted to follow a diet that had you, you know, not eating fruit, not eating um, dairy foods, cutting out too many carbs. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And that should actually say, it should say 90 to 99% of diets do not work long term. So anywhere between 1 to 10% of, of diets work long term. And that's mostly because the person would have to stick to it for as long as they want to see the results. And I tend to think of, you know, if a car, really nice looking car, had a 99% rate of breaking down, would you buy that car? No, common sense says no, logic says no. I would not spend my hard-earned money on buying that car, even though it looks nice on the outside. Well, we're still falling, you know, I think the last, number that I heard was $4 billion is how much money the diet industry makes each year. Because we're still, we still want that, you know, that magic bullet, that kind of easy way. And just in the long term, I'd rather have you save your money and go back to that sound nutrition. And yo-yo diet or losing weight quickly and then gaining it back can actually harm our metabolism. You know, I've worked with women especially that I've worked with you know, in their 50s and 60s, their metabolism has been really harmed because of the really restrictive diets that they followed. So we got to heal that metabolism through a lot of the things that we've talked about in order to really help them feel and live better. Other helpful and healthful meal planning tips, I knew that would be a tongue twister. Eat at regular intervals. So if you find that, if you're doing these four things right here, you're probably doing pretty well. So aim to eat a meal or a snack every three to five hours. Why do you think that can help in the long run with our health, with our weight management, with our blood sugar? Overeat? Yes. <laughs> think of those days where you skipped breakfast, you had a meeting at lunch, and you finally ate at five or six o'clock at night. What did that meal look like? Whatever's fast, whatever easy, the convenience foods, you know. And we don't tend to stick to our, our healthy eating plan when we're overly hungry. Because again, our body goes into that famine mode. We want whatever we can get as fast as we can get it. So if you have a plan, if you know, you know, this is what I'm gonna eat now, this is what I'm gonna have for a snack, this is what I'm gonna have for lunch, that really sets you up to be successful. Eating balanced meals and snacks. So whenever, you know, I'm looking at somebody's food records, how am I doing? Well, one thing that I always look for is, are you eating carbs and protein and fat at most meals? If you're doing that, if you're following the plate model, you're probably doing pretty well. The hunger awareness scale is something that I use pretty often, and it is, uh, it's also known as intuitive eating. So a one is that absolutely ravenous hunger that you will eat whatever you can get your hands on where a five is pretty neutral and a 10 is I'm overly stuffed. You know, we usually try to get people to stay in between about a three and a six or a seven. That's the safe zone because when we get too hungry, we don't make the best choices and then we tend to catapult ourselves over into that overly full. So that's a really useful tool. And then staying hydrated, I see a lot of water bottles on the table, that's great. Drinking water throughout the day, having it with you as often as possible. I like to say that I'm a self-described camel. If I did not carry a water bottle, I wouldn't miss it. I, would, I could go all day, not need any water. But once I carry it, I remember to drink it. So the benefit there is that thirst can feel like hunger. If you stay hydrated, it helps you figure out, am I truly hungry or am I thirsty? All right, so thank you.